good. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so uh, welcome to the next uh, lecture of parameters algorithm. Today, today, the topic is iterative compression. I will be using a slightly different uh, form of slice than margin. Uh, it will not be really slice. You should now see the um, like my shared screen where you have um, kind of a notepad with, with, with some notes. Uh, so if you are, uh, if this is uh, uh, fine with you and uh, you see it and uh, there is no problem, please put a plus one on in the chat so that we can see that we have a two-way communication here. Yay, I see plus ones, good. Um, great, so we will be doing this this way. Uh, so the nodes, all of the nodes you can, uh, they're also put on Moodle, so if you want to, to, to have all the nodes as, as one PDF so that draws to some preface definition or something, then you can also download it now from the Moodle to, uh, to have a PDF uh, uh, on, on behalf. Good, so today's, uh, um, today's um, topic is iterative compression, uh, which is a technique in, in, in parameterized uh, algorithms, uh, quite a basic technique, so, so far we are going through, uh, through basic techniques. And it is a general technique that can be applied to problems uh, that are sort of vertex deletion problems or edge deletion problems. Essentially, all these problems that, uh, that we can um, attack using this technique uh, are problems of the form uh, delete k vertices from a given graph or delete k edges from a given graph to get some graph of some particular form. So let's look at two examples of such problems. Uh, two examples, one example you have already have seen uh, during this course, this is the, 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 the vertex cover problem. Namely, this vertex cover problem is that uh, we would like to pick k vertices in my graph uh, so that every edge in my graph has at least one endpoint selected, right? So I can rephrase this problem to say that I would like to take my graph and delete at most k vertices from each to get an edgeless graph, right? So a graph that doesn't have any edges, this is a uh, reformulation of this problem. So now you can uh, think of, of, of different examples such of, of uh, such problems where, for instance, I can uh, get a graph and I ask whether I can delete k vertices to get some uh, other graph with some other uh, uh, special structural property. For instance, in the feedback vertex problem, which is one of our favorite problems in, in parameterized complexity, uh, the question is whether I can delete k vertices from a given graph to get an acyclic graph. So in other words, to get a forest. Right? So for instance, if you look at this graph, uh, how many vertices I would need to delete uh, to get a forest? Well, it, it may seem reasonable to delete this vertex because it participates in many different cycles. And then if, for instance, I delete this vertex, yes, then I get an acyclic graph, which is actually a path here. But for instance, if I um, delete it, I don't know, um, uh, maybe if instead of this one, I deleted this one and that one and, uh, that one, I would also get a nice feedback vertex set, which now are two paths, which is a forest, uh, a, again, a, an acyclic graph. So in general, the, after the, the, um, the structure that we are looking for in a graph is that in my graph, I should have a set X of at most K vertices, yes, such that after deletion of this, of this set, the remaining graph should be a forest, should be acyclic, it should look like that, right? Good. So this is the this is the problem that we are uh, interested. So observe now that the uh, so feedback vertex set is one of our favorite problems in parameterized complexity because it is actually parameter structurable, but there is no immediate way to see this. So in particular, recall that in the vertex cover problem, what we um, what we had is that uh, we were branching on edges whenever we see an edge uh, in, in the graph, we know that at least one endpoint of this edge must be deleted, so we can branch into two different directions. So if you apply the same principle to feedback vertex set, we would um, well branch on cycles, yeah, because we need to break every cycle. But cycles can be long, right? So there are no just two branches in which you can, uh, you can branch, there is an unbounded number of branches, so that's trivial uh, branching algorithm uh, would not give an FPT algorithm. Yeah? It would be something like n, n power k, because in the worst case, I'm branching in n different directions at every point. Uh, however, the
in, in the parameterized complexity book. So you can uh, see the notes there to, to, to see what I'm talking about. In the Platypus book, there's also another algorithm, uh, a better algorithm that builds on top of this uh, five power K, which runs in power in, in time two plus golden ratio to the power K polynomial. And this is currently the fastest deterministic algorithm for, for feedback vertex set. Uh, so fastest deterministic. The fastest in general, so a randomized one works, I think, in time 2.7 power k. And this is a result from this year. So this is a result of Lee and Nadelov of this year. Right, so, but for now, it will be a uh, basic algorithm with, with running time 5 power, five power k, which is uh, like, a, um, we would like to present it in order to uh, to showcase how to uh, apply iterative compression to, uh, to parameterized problems. Okay, so is the goal and the problem that we are now trying to solve clear? Please put plus one in the chat if you are on the same page now. Good. I see some plus ones. Um, so let's proceed further. Okay, so what's the main idea of iterative compression? The iterative compression, um, as, as the name suggests, uh, it is iterative. It essentially boils down to some sort of an induction. And the idea is to introduce the vertices of my graph one by one and maintain a solution um, to, to my problem. So let's order the vertices in, in, in an arbitrary way. So CSA V1, V2, V3, V4, up to Vn. Um, and let us introduce them um, one by one. So for instance, I can start with an empty graph, right? So at the beginning, I have a graph G0, which is just an empty graph. Once I introduce uh, the vertex V1, I have my first graph G1, which is just the graph induced by only the vertex V1. This is not a very interesting graph so far, yes? After I introduce V2, I've got graph G2, which is the graph that is induced by V1 and V2, yes? And so on and so on. So G3, Gn minus one, and I'll, after I introduce all the vertices, yes, I've got my original graph G, uh, which I'm interested in. Right, so I introduce vertices one by one, and whenever a vertex is introduced, then all the edges that are uh, incident to this vertex are introduced as well, right? So now the observation is that if this graph at the end has a feedback vertex set of size at most k, Yes, so this is a feedback vertex set, so a set of vertices such as deletion of it uh, yields a forest. Then each of these previous graphs, yes, should also have a solution like that. Yes, uh, for instance, G3 should have a solution X3, yes, in G3, which is a feedback vertex set of size at most k, right? Because I could just take the, the, the final feedback vertex set and restrict it to, to the um, to the to the vertices of G3, yeah. So the idea is that we will introduce this uh, this vertices one by one, and every time I introduce a new vertex uh, to get the next graph, I will try to compute a solution to the new um, to the new instance to the new uh, for for the new graph. Yes. Yeah? So I compute the solutions x0, x1, x2, and so on up to xn at the end, and of course the last solution, which is a solution for the whole graph, is what I was interested in. Uh, what I was interested in in the first place. So now comes the, the crucial uh, observation. So obs imagine that we have already, com we have already uh, looked at the GI minus one, yeah? so the, the previous graph in the, in the iteration, and we have solution XI minus one um, for this graph, yes? So now we would like to add the new vertex uh, VI to this and compute a solution XI. Right? But now if I look at this graph GI, yes, then I see a solution for this, which is one too large. If I just take the previous solution and I add the vertex VI to it, yes, I have a set of vertices such that the deletion of these vertices yields a forest, right? Because by removing VI, I get from GI, I get uh, GI minus one. And by removing the, the previous solution, Yes, 
Um, we get uh, we get a forest by assumption because this was a solution for the previous step. Yeah. So this set, the previous solution plus the new vertex, is always a solution for the next graph, but it is a slightly too large solution. Yeah, because the previous solution was of size at most k. So by adding one more vertex, I get a solution that is uh, slightly too large. Right. So in essence, what we end up with is that essentially when solving feedback vertex set, we can focus on this uh, problem that I will call feedback vertex set compression. Yes, I'm given an instance of feedback vertex set, so a graph G and an integer K for which I would like to find a feedback vertex set of size at most K. And from the previous iteration, what I can get is that I can get a solution that is slightly too large, that is of size at most k plus, uh, k plus one. So a set z of size at most k plus one, such that the deletion of this, of this set from the graph yields a fourth. Yeah? And now I ask the same question as in the, as in the original um, situation. Yeah? So does g have a feedback vertex set of size at most k? Yeah? So the situation now is that I essentially have still the same uh, question of feedback vertex set, but what I can assume is that in my graph, I have moreover highlighted a solution that is one too, one too large. Yeah? So now the basic observation is that if for this feedback vertex set compression problem, where I have a solution that, uh, that I have additional solution given to me, I have, a, um, I have a, an algorithm with running time, some function of k times some polynomial, say n power c, then for the original feedback vertex set problem, I can get a, an algorithm with running time the same, but with an additional factor of n, right? Because what I will do, I will just introduce the vertices one by one, and that every time when I'm introducing the next vertex, I get a z. This will be my previous solution, xi minus one plus the new vertex vi, yes? And uh, I will apply my subroutine for feedback vertex of compression to, so, to make the next step in the iteration. Yeah? So the main idea of this, of, this, uh, of this fact is that essentially for free, we can assume that when solving feedback vertex, we have in hand a solution that is one too large. And this solution Z, as on this picture here on the right, it can serve to sort of highlight the structure uh, in my graph. Yeah? Because we are not now working with an arbitrary graph where we would like to find a feedback vertex set. We are working uh, with a graph such that there is a small set of vertices Z whose deletion yields a forest. So a very well understood graph. Okay, so is this, um, is this strategy clear so far or are there any questions? Could you point? go over a, a bit more explicitly how, this, how we use the subroutine to get the full algorithm? Yeah, so, okay, so we start with uh, the graph G0, yeah? And for the graph G0, which is an empty graph, we have a trivial solution, which is like zero, which is the empty solution, right? Then what I'm doing, I'm, at this point, I'm adding one more vertex, yes? I'm getting a graph G1, yes? And for this graph G1, I have a set Z, yes? Which is the previous solution, plus the new vertex, V1, which is a solution that is one too large. Yes, it is a set, a set of size at most k plus one. Um, so now I apply the compression, yes, to get a solution for my new graph, G1 next one. Yeah, so this compression algorithm could have said that, um, that there is no solution, but if there is no solution for the graph G1, then there is no solution for the graph G, yeah? Because all these graphs, uh, all the induced subgraphs should have solutions, yeah? So the compression algorithm should give me a solution of size at most K for the, um, for the graph G1, yes? Which I feed to the next iteration. So in the next iteration, what I will now do, I will get, uh, take graph G2 and a set Z for it, for it uh, which is the set X1 plus the new vertex V2. And now I will again apply the compression, yes, yes, to get a solution for the graph G2. Yeah, and so on and so on until 
I either in the iteration, uh, at some point it will tell me that uh, there is no solution, so there is no solution for the whole graph, or I will arrive at, uh, at the solution for uh, at the end. Okay, so did I answer the question? Yeah, so, so we, in, as stated, the compression algorithm is a, like it's a decision problem, but we can modify it to get the actual... Uh, ah, yes, that is a very, very good point. Actually, I, I, I missed it. Yes, the, the compression problem should actually give me, uh, give me a solution, because this is a solution that I will feed to the next uh, round. Yeah, so um, let me add it here and return one. Yeah, so indeed the, the compression algorithm should be actually a constructive algorithm. It cannot be just a decision error. Good. Thank you. Are there any questions? So please put a plus one if you're on the same page so far. Okay, good. So now we are, uh, we are trying to, to solve this compression subroutine. So uh, recall that now we have a set Z here of size at most K plus one, yes? And we would like to find a feedback vertex at the minus. So now when we have a set of size uh, uh, K plus one, which is small, if we do not care about uh, precise dependence on K, we have a very cheap, easy step of branching. Branching what happens in this set Z. Yes, yeah, so in my solution, uh, how, how my solution will look like, so my solution will actually delete some vertices from here. Yes, but it will also delete some vertices from Z. Yeah, it, it is allowed to do it. Yeah, so some vertices of the previous solution might be also uh, included in the next solution. So what I will do, I will by branching, I will guess the set call it xz, yes, uh, that should go into the solution, that should go into the solution x. Yes, so by branching into uh, two to the k plus one uh, subroutines, branches, yes, um, I am assuming now that I know exactly what is the intersection of my, of, of the optimal solution and the set z. So once I fixed this, uh, this set XZ, I can do some cleaning up operations. Yes, I can definitely, I can remove this whole part from the consideration because it will uh, definitely go to the, to the solution. And I can reduce the budget. Uh, I will actually call this budget L in the future. So uh, let's, let's call it L. That the budget for the, for the remaining uh, deletions is, is K minus the size uh, of this XZ, the, the size of the part that I deleted. Yeah, and now let W be this remaining part. Yeah, so this is still um, a set such as deleting the set yells me, uh, gives me a, um, a forest, yes? But uh, we are left uh, with essentially the following problem, which I will call disjoint feedback vertex. So now what we have is that we have the set W here, yes? Such that the remaining part of the graph is a forest, but because we have assumed that we have guessed all the vertices from this, uh, from this, uh, from this uh, set Z that should go to the solution, I can now assume that nobody else from W will go to the solution. So we are given a, set, uh, a graph G, yes, and a set W, such that the remaining part is a forest, and I ask whether in the remaining part I can find a feedback vertex set of size, um, a feedback vertex set uh, that is disjoint with W. And this set X, should have size smaller than W, yeah? Because recall that at this point here, yes? Here we had that uh, the size of Z is K plus one, yes? We can assume without loss of general that it is K plus one because otherwise uh, Z is already a solution for the next iteration, yes? So we removed some number of vertices, say five vertices, and we decreased the budget by, by this number five, yeah, that we removed, yes? So at this point, we have a solution W, yes? We are looking for a solution that is disjoint with the set W. So that can look like that, for instance. Yes, and whose size is strictly smaller than W. Yeah, because we are looking for a solution that is, um, that is strictly smaller um, than this one too large solution that we were uh, on. Yeah, and now we can assume that the solution we are looking for is disjoint with, 
with the with w yeah and the the, w, the size of w which i will call l is the parameter right so now the lemma is that if i am able to to solve this disjoint feedback vertex set oh yes in some uh, in some running time then i can solve the um, the feedback vertex set compression which as we have seen um, implies that i can solve feedback vertex in in, in, in parameter style, yeah? So I claim that if I can solve the, um, the disjoint feedback vertex at in time f of L times some polynomial, then I can solve uh, my feedback vertex at compression in, in, um, in also fixed parameter time, and then um, the, the original uh, feedback vertex at growth. Right, so why? Well, what we do, uh, we essentially, we guess the set, uh, set W, yeah? So the set um, of, f f from this, from this uh, uh, solution Z that, uh, that should go into the solution. So if the size of W is L, yes, then how many instances uh, with, uh, with, with L uh, will we get? Well, K plus one choose L, yeah? Because out of this K plus one vertices of Z, yes, we need to choose L uh, vertices from W. And this works for, and this we do for all possible L, for all L between K and zero. Yeah, this is the guess of how many vertices from that will go into the, will not go into the solution. Uh, okay. Right, so then we branch into this many instances for every, for every L, and for each of them we run uh, an algorithm that runs in time F of L times n to the power c, yeah? So the total running time will be the sum over all else, yes, here it should be k plus one, uh, of uh, k plus one choose l times this, yeah? So this now is a function of k only, call it f hat k, yes? So uh, by guessing what happens on, on, on Z and then solving the disjoint feedback vertex set problem on the rest, uh, I, get, uh, I, get, uh, uh, I get a fixed parameter tractable algorithm for the compression and then for the original uh, problem. Okay, so uh, was this clear? Are there any questions at this point? If not, put plus one so that we are uh, happy. Hmm, was I too fast? If something is unclear, please say so. Okay, so I would like to ask if I mm -hmm. understood correctly. We now want to solve this disjoint problem using mm -hmm. the same algorithm as before? No, we will make a separate algorithm for the disjoint problem. Okay, so could you please shortly summarize how, how it goes? Okay, so... Like shortly. Like, we want to solve feedback vertex at compression. Yeah. So how we solve feedback vertex at compression? We branch into into two power k plus one instances of disjoint feedback vertex. Yeah? So in each of these instances, we fix a different set uh, xz of vertices from z that should be uh, included in the solution. Yeah. Yeah? And then we remove those vertices from xz, from, from, from z, call the rest w, and run the algorithm for this joint feedback vertex. Yeah? So what we essentially did, we, um, we now, in order to solve one instance of feedback vertex of compression, we are solving two power k plus one instances of this joint feedback vertex. So if this we can, if this joint feedback vertex that we can solve in fixed parameter time, then feedback vertex at compression as well, because we are just multiplying by two power k plus one. So what happens here below is a more uh, specific uh, um, estimation of the running. 
So the proof here is the proof of the step from an algorithm for disjoint ver uh, feedback vertex yeah. step to feedback vertex step compression. Yes, this proof is the proof of this implication. Yeah, this, this implication we already did on the, on the previous page. But the problem in each branch we use using the same algorithm. Yeah, we will use the same algorithm for disjoint feedback vertex set that I will present later on. Okay. Yeah, so this is a reduction of, uh, of solving feedback vertex set compression to solving fe disjoint feedback vertex. Yeah, are there any more questions? Is this clear what happens? Yeah, so please put plus one if you are on the same page. Yeah, good. Good, so let's, uh, so as I said that we are solving two power K plus one instance of this joint feedback vertex set, which uh, immediately shows that, um, that if I am able to solve this in F, F of K times polynomial time, then I can do uh, the same for feedback vertex set compression. But uh, what we are actually doing, we are solving the, the, the new running time is like that. Yeah, that is parametric factor. Yeah, because we are solving this many instances with, uh, with, with uh, um, size of W equal to L. Yes, and on each we are using F of L time, times a polynomial. So observe that what happens if, um, is if F of L, yes, is C power L, yeah, which is uh, for some constant C, yeah. Then this sum, sum from L equal to zero to, uh, to K plus one, yes, K plus one choose L times C power L, right? Um, well, you should already see what this is, yeah? This is exactly the same as C plus one power K plus one. This is just the Newton expansion, right? So this means that if we are able to give a four power L, algorithm for disjoint feedback vertex set, then this will imply a five power L times polynomial for compression. Yeah, which in turn will uh, imply five power L for feedback vertex. Yeah, so in here, what is hidden is that uh, I am multiplying by N because we are making N steps of compression. Good, so the current goal is this. We want to give a four power L algorithm for disjoint feedback vertex. Good, so let's recap what we are, uh, what, uh, what, what is the set. So now the setting is that we've got the set W, which is a solution in the sense that removing this W leaves the rest of the graph being a forest. Yeah, so this is a forest and I will call it H. Yeah. L is the size of W. And I am asking whether in, in, in this whole graph, I can find a feedback vertex set that has size at most L minus one. Yeah. So observe that it may make sense, of course, to, to remove vertices from H because there might be some edges between W and H. And these are the edges that I really do not understand uh, at this point. And uh, in order to break cycles that go through W and through the rest of the graph, I may need to remove some vertices from H. Right, so we are going to use branching essentially, but let's uh, do some uh, easy cleanup operations. So we are going to use the fact that the, 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 the remainder of the graph, the graph H, yeah, so here, is a forest. And we really understand how forests look like. Yeah? Forests always have leaves. Yeah? So I will always fi find a vertex here. Yeah? Actually, multiple of them probably, but at least one. A vertex which is a leaf which has degree at most one in H. Yeah? So let me take any leaf U of H and consider how it really looks. Okay, so here is this leaf U. Maybe it has no edges in, uh, it has no uh, neighbors in W. Yeah? So here is the set W 
and maybe it doesn't have any neighbors in that. Well, then this vertex has only uh, degree one in my graph, right? I can just remove it from consideration. I can just remove it from my instance because this vertex does not participate in any cycle. There's no point in, in, in deleting it in a feedback vertex at instance, yeah? Because I will not kill any cycles by killing it. Yeah, so I can just remove it from consideration. So this is a reduction. There is no branching at this. Okay, there might be another situation, yes, where this vertex has only one neighbor in W. Yeah, so here is the set W and there is only one neighbor here. So this vertex in the whole graph, it has degree uh, at most two. At most one neighbor, which is a neighbor in, 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 in this forest upstairs, yes, and at most one neighbor in W. Well, then deleting this vertex doesn't make much sense uh, because, well, deleting his neighbor in W actually makes more sense, right? Because any cycle that I can kill by killing U, yes, I can also kill by killing uh, his neighbor, say U prime, right? And it can only kill more cycles. So I can make a reduction in my problem to get an equivalent instance by, it's called, the operation is called bypassing. Bypassing me, yeah? So now instead of, instead of uh, you, I will just remove you together with this, with this edge and I will just replace it with a single edge uh, from this neighbor from W to U prime, yeah? Because essentially what I'm now doing, I'm shortening a path of length two, like a detached path of length two into a single edge. And this is safe in the instance because whatever solution was removing this, 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 this vertex U, yes, I can make a solution that has at most the same size that deletes U prime instead. I hope that this uh, reduction is, is, should be kind of clear. Good. So, do you see uh, do you see this this, this reductions of bypassing and removing, uh, or are there any questions at this point? Plus ones, plus ones. Uh, please put plus ones if you are uh, if you if you, if, you, if you follow. Good. I've seen some plus ones, so let's continue. So now we are at the interesting case the remaining case, where my vertex U, yes, has more than, uh, more than one uh, neighbor in, in W. So the situation is like that, that I've got my vertex U here, yes, I've got here my maybe one, maybe zero neighbor in, in, in W, in, uh, sorry, in, in H, and here I've got uh, two or more neighbors in, 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 in W. Good. So the main observation is the following. Imagine that I have a situation where this vertex U has two neighbors, say W1 and W2, yes, in W, such that in the graph induced by W, they are in the same connected component, yeah? So in the graph induced by the set W in, uh, in, in, in G, uh, these vertices, these neighbors are connected, yeah? then I claim that U must be included in my solution X that I'm looking for. And the proof is, is, is really simple. You can see it on the picture, where if, well, if um, W1 and W2 are in the same connected component of G of W, yes, then I can find here a path in G of W between W1 and W2, yeah? And this path together with those two edges through U, this forms a cycle. Yeah, and on the cycle, U is the only vertex, vertex we are allowed to delete, right? Yeah, because uh, uh, vertices from W are not allowed to be deleted, yeah? So if I want to make a feedback vertex set, yes, I need to delete U. So uh, we have the next reduction that whenever we have such a situation, we are just deleting you, yes, 
And by deleting Q, we mean that we take it into the solution and reduce L by one, yes, the, the budget for the, uh, for the feedback vertex set, and we continue. Yeah? Good. So this is a crucial point. So please put plus one uh, if, if, if you got this argument, or ask a question if not. Yeah. So we are left with a situation. The remaining case is when, when I look at my vertex U, yes, it has two or more neighbors in W, but they all must lie in different connected components of G of W. Um, yeah. So now the idea is that we will just branch on you. Yeah. I, by branch on you, I mean go into two branches. In one case, assume that you should be included in the optimum solution. And in the other case, assume that you should not be included in the optimum solution. Right? So in the branch that, um, that uh, where we are including uh, you in the optimum solution, it, it's clear what we do. Yeah, we delete you from, uh, from the instance, yeah, from the, from the graph, and we are reducing the budget uh, by one because now we are looking for an even smaller feedback. Yeah, um, and kind of a progress, yes, in the red branch, in the, in the branch where we are actually um, taking you into the solution is, is clear, yeah, because the budget decreases. In the other branch, the, the green branch, we are assuming that U is not taking the solution. Yeah? So what we can do then, if we assume that U is not taking the solution, well, you, we can mark U as undeletable, yeah? because we already decided it will not go to the solution. So we can safely just include U into W, because W is the set of undeletable vertices, right? So now the main point is, what is the progress here? Yes, so this is kind of unclear at the beginning, yeah, because we did not decrease the budget. Yeah, it, it doesn't seem that we have made some progress in the branch. But here is the main point. Oh, this should be actually green. What is the progress in the green branch? Yes, where we are not taking the solution. The idea is that when this U is being added to W, it is gluing some of the connected components, at least two of them, yeah? Because we have at least two neighbors in two different connected components. So what happens is that the number of connected components in G of W strictly decreases, yeah? And it was at most L um, uh, in the first place, yeah, because we started um, with, uh, with, with a set of size at most L, or L plus one, maybe L plus one, yes? Uh, so it can only decrease at most L plus one times, yeah? So we are making a progress towards connecting G of W. That's the main point. Okay, so let's make this argument formal. So for an instance I, and an instance I is this uh, G comma W comma L, which is the budget for, for the remainder of the, of the deletions, yes? Let this be this L plus the number of connected components of G of W. Yeah, so this is my potential. So at the beginning, the potential it is at most uh, two L, probably 12 plus one, yeah? Because the, the initial, uh, no, it's actually two L. Oh, 12 plus one, sorry. Uh, it's actually 12 plus one because we have L budget for the initial deletions, yes? And then the number of connected components, yes, is at most L plus one, yeah? So now um, in, in each branch, what happens is that in one branch, this L, this part of the potential decreases, and in the other branch, this part of the potential decreases. So in both branches, this potential decreases strictly. Yeah. So now what, you, what we can argue is that uh, the, the whole recursion tree has uh, at most two power, the initial potential, um, the initial potential leaves, yes? Because uh, um, we always branch into two, su two, su uh, two sub problems and in each the potential decreases, which means that I have that many leaves of the whole recursion tree. So the running time is bounded by the number of leaves times a polynomial because we use polynomial 
um, time for every uh, for every node of the recursion tree. Okay, so um, is this clear? Uh, are there any questions at this point? Please put a plus one then, if you if you understood this argument. Mm, I do not see too many plus ones. Uh, if uh, is 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 there something I should repeat? Okay, so let me make a recap, maybe. Maybe it will uh, help you in, in, in getting. So what we are doing now, we are doing this joint, this joint feedback vertex set, yes, by branching in time four power L times polynomial. Then using the subroutine for this joint feedback vertex that we can do compression feedback, feedback vertex set compression. Compression in time five power L times a polynomial. And then by adding vertices one by one, we can do feedback vertex in time. Five power L times a polynomial. And the key point in this branching is that we use measure ma me of q of, of, of the instance, which is the budget L for the remaining deletions, plus the number of connected components, connected components of the subgraph induced by the undeletable part. Good. Are there any questions? Should I repeat something here? Mm, could you pl put a plus one if, if, if the whole algorithm is clear? Because this is the end of the algorithm for, uh, for the five power L algorithm for feedback vertex. Good, uh, I see some uh, plus ones, so let me continue. So yeah, so this was the, uh, the, the prime example of, uh, of uh, application of, of, feedback of, uh, of iterative compression. And note that this is a generic uh, technique, yeah? Essentially what we did, we in a generic way took a problem, which was a vertex deletion problem. We reduced it to, feed, to, to, to this problem compression var variant, where we have a solution of, that is slightly too large, too large by at most one. And then by branching on this uh, on this uh, part uh, on, on on this uh, uh, solution that was one too large, we could focus on the disjoint variant of the problem where we have a solution, but we cannot take anything from this solution. Yes, and this is a generic uh, scheme uh, that works for a wide variety of problems because actually for feedback vertex set we only use the the specific uh, combinatorics of feedback vertex set in this last step. Yeah, so I can, for instance, look at the, um, the general problem of say a C vertex deletion problem where C is a class of graphs. Yeah, so in the C vertex deletion problem, I have as input a graph G and an integer K, which is my parameter. And I would like to ask whether I can remove at most K vertices, yes, in order to get a graph from my class C. So for instance, if C is edgeless, then this is a, uh, then this is a, um, what's it called? So then this is a vertex cover. And if C is a forest, is the class of forest, then this is feedback vertex. Yeah. Um, yeah, as written here. So now what you see is that uh, if I have a FPT uh, algorithm for the disjoint uh, variant of the problem, yes, then I have a uh, FPT algorithm for the compression variant of the problem by this, by this branching on, the, uh, on what from Z goes to the solution. And then by iterating one by one, uh, adding more and more vertices, I get an FPT algorithm for the, um, for the original problem. Yes? Uh, and observe that essentially these steps of the, of the reasoning are for free in the sense that uh, I could just apply them. Uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this is basic times n 
Um, so here we lose times n in the complexity, and here we essentially lose times to power to power k plus one in the complexity. Um, and we can always simply assume when solving such a vertex deletion problem that we have a solution that is slightly too large. And this is very, may be very useful because it helps you to understand what you are trying to do. Good. So now we will try to show two, uh, two, two other examples of, uh, of um, application of, 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 of integral. Excuse me. Yes. Could you please explain one more time this node which was here? No. Ah, uh, if we're interested only in FTT or not, this is for free. Uh, well, this was not very formal, what I said, in a sense. Um, so in particular, I think that uh, particular this implication is for free. Yeah, because, uh, sorry, uh, not this one, but uh, this one. Yeah. So if I'm interested in proving this, yes. Okay, in that's free, that not free. I, I misunderstood the writing. Ah. Oh, so okay. I have no question. Okay, good. So if I, just to repeat, if I'm interested in proving that, yes, I'm, I may as well look at this problem and this problem, I simply have more information, right? I just have an additional solution that help, may help me in understanding things. Good. So next we, are, we will be doing, um, we will look at uh, another problem called feedback vertex set in tournaments. Actually, I should uh, write a direct feedback vertex set in tournaments. And in the directed feedback vertex set uh, uh, problem, this is a problem on directed graphs. Um, and it is defined similarly as, as the original uh, feedback vertex set problem on undirected graphs. Now I would like to delete at most k vertices from a given graph in order to get an acyclic graph. Yes? And a cyclic in terms of directed graphs means a directed acyclic graph, which uh, underlying graph might not be a forest. So for instance, in this, uh, in this instance, I see here a directed triangle. So maybe it makes sense to remove this vertex. Uh, here is also a directed triangle. So maybe it makes sense to remove this vertex. Yes. And now when you look at the remaining vertices, um, there is no directed cycle. Yeah, because uh, the, remaining vert the remaining vertices induce in this graph uh, a directed acyclic graph. Yeah, because there is no directed cycle. Uh, good. So this problem is actually FPT in general digraphs. Digraphs. And we will probably see this algorithm in maybe in a month. Uh, we will need uh, more tools to, to, to prove it. But we will now show an algorithm, uh, a, a, an efficient FPT algorithm for the case of tournaments. And uh, a tournament is simply a directed acyclic graph, uh, a directed graph, sorry, where between every pair of vertices I have an edge, I have an arc, directed this way or that way. And a cyclic tournament, so you can very easily see how they look like. Uh, so uh, if, if, if T is a tournament, then being a cyclic is equivalent to having no directed triangles and it's equivalent to being transitive and by transitive tournament i mean a tournament that you can lay out in a linear order so that all the edges are going to the to the left let's say to the left so essentially an ordering where the edges uh, give you a, a, a total order on the on the, on, on the graph so to prove this lemma, this is actually a very simple thing. Yes, uh, the implication from uh, one to two is obvious. Yes, and from three to uh, say two or three to one is also obvious. Yes, if I'm transitive, I cannot have any 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 directed cycles uh, or triangles. Implication from one to two. Uh, observe that if I had a longer cycle, directed cycle, then because of, I'm a tournament, yes, I need to have a chord here, directed this way or the other way, yes? And whatever direction is of the chord, I see here a shorter cycle. Yes, so whenever I have a longer cycle, I can find it a shorter cycle, and so on and so on, up to getting triangles. Um, yeah, so if I contain a longer cycle, I have a, a, a longer directed cycle, I have a directed triangle as well. And if I do not have any directed cycles or directed uh, triangles in particular, then I'm transitive. Uh, this simply uh, take uh, any topological ordering 
ordering. Yeah, if I have a duck, it has a topological ordering. So an ordering where all the edges are going to the left. And because all the arcs are there, this topological ordering must look like that. Good, so is this lemma clear? Uh, please put plus ones if you are on the same page and the problem is clear. Yeah, good. Right. So we are working now with feedback vertexes in tournaments, uh, which uh, essentially now by the previous lemma boils to the problem of hitting all directed uh, triangles with at most k vertices, right? Uh, so now we very easily see a free power k branching algorithm. Yeah, I can just branch on, uh, on, on directed triangles. Whenever I see a directed triangle in my graph, I just branch whether delete this guy or that guy or that guy, yes? And um, so in each case, I remove the budget by, I reduce the budget by one. So I get a branching tree uh, of branching free, yes, and the depth, okay. Giving me this algorithm similarly as for uh, vertex cap. So now our goal is to use iterative compression to improve it a bit. Namely, instead of three power k, I would like to have two power k. So let's recall what we are trying to do. We are trying to solve feedback vertex set in tournaments, actually directed feedback vertex set in tournaments, which by iterative compression boils down to solving directed feedback vertex set in tournaments compression. Yeah. Uh, so a problem where I additionally have a set Z, yes, which a, is a solution. T minus Z is transitive, it's a transitive tournament, yes. And my set Z, my solution that I'm given is one too large. Yeah, because I, what I will do, I will iteratively add vertices to my tournament, starting with an empty tournament. Whenever I add a vertex, it comes with all the edges. Yes, and uh, I will try to compress the previous uh, solution to a new solution. Good. So now solving this compression boils down to a uh, disjoint variant, yes, where I have a set W, yes, and I'm looking for a solution which is disjoint with W. Yeah. Uh, so how I do this reduction, again, I have the set Z, that is my solution from the previous iteration. Here is the remainder of the tournament, which is transitive, yes? And I'm guessing here who should go to the solution, and the remainder of the, of the set Z is my set W, which I am not allowed to delete anymore, right? And the basic observation from the, from the iterative compression is that if I am able to get a polynomial time algorithm for disjoint feedback vertex at, uh, um, in tournaments, then I can get two power k algorithm for v feedback vertex, right? Because uh, in this implication, I will do branch on two power k plus one subsets of z. Yeah, so now we want to prove to give a polynomial time algorithm for the joint feedback vertex. Good, is this clear? Uh, are there any questions? Can you put plus ones if this is clear? Good. Um, okay, so now the situation is as follows. Uh, we've got the tournament, uh, we've got a set, uh, set um, W here, so a tournament uh, also induced by it, and we've got the rest. So the rest definitely should be transitive, yeah, because we assume that this uh, W should be a solution. But also W itself, this, uh, the, the tournament induced by it, yes, should be transitive tournament, because if I see a directed uh, triangle already there, then I'm completely toasted, right? I cannot remove any of its, uh, of its vertices, because W is um, a set that, uh, that is now uh, not allowed to be deleted. Yeah? So, I, um, so I can assume that T of W, yeah, the subgraph induced by W, is also transitive. So essentially what we have now is that we have two transitive tournaments and some edges in between them. I don't know how they really work. Yes. And we would like to remove some vertices from, the, from this upper part, from H, in order to make the whole thing transitive. So now the, the, the basic observation is uh, the same as before. Imagine that for some vertex here, say U, we had the situation that if we added U to, to W, then this tournament here, yes, 
would not be transit. Yeah. Then of course uh, I can remove that. I can assume that uh, u is my is in my so must be in my solution, right? Because if u could not be added in the uh, was not in the solution, then well I cannot uh, remove anything from w. Yeah. So if there is a say directed triangle looking like that. Uh, Yes, then I would not be able to make a transitive tournament D. Yes, yeah? so such U can be, uh, must be, must be uh, in the solution and therefore we can reduce such U. Yes, yeah? so reduce such U. So now this means that whenever I look at a one particular vertex U from the above, from the tournament H, then adding him to, the, uh, to, to, to W makes a transitive tournament. So then you can easily see that the situation must look like that, that I have outgoing arcs to a prefix of, of W, of this transitive order in W, and then incoming arcs from the suffix, yes? Because if I had an outgoing arc to somewhere here, and an incoming arc from somewhere later, then together with this arc, I would get a, a directed triangle, yeah? So every U must look like that. So essentially every U must have like its specific favorite place where to be put in T of W. Yes, how to be sorted into this, uh, into this transitive order. So each of them, for instance, this guy would like to go into this gap, maybe a different color. This guy wants to go into this gap. Maybe this guy wants to go into this gap. This guy would like to go into this gap. This guy maybe want to go in, in, in before everybody. So now to every vertex from H, I can assign like the index of the gap of the, of the preferred place. Maybe this guy will get zero. Maybe this guy would like to go to gap number two, this guy to gap number three, gap number one, five, four, maybe three, seven, uh, three, four, nine. Yeah. So this is where these guys would like to go when being sorted into T of W. And now comes the main observation. Uh, if I would like to understand what subsets of this I can add to, to T of W, so what, uh, what, what, I, what subsets of those of, of H I can leave in, uh, not including my solution, yeah? then these are exactly sets that correspond to non-decreasing subsequences of this sequence that I just now wrote, yeah? Because if I, for instance, take a zero, a two, a three, say uh, a four, a seven, and a nine, this means that this vertex would like to go here, this vertex would like to go here, this vertex would like to go here, and so on and so on, yes? So all of them will be nicely sorted into T of W. And on the other hand, if I simultaneously took a five and a four, this means that this guy uh, has an R going like that, and this guy has an R going like that. And then you see here, together with this edge, a directed triangle uh, that is disallowed. Yeah? So then this observation tells you that what we are now interested in is finding non-decreasing subsequences of this sequence of preferred places. Yeah. So, so yeah. Who uh, are there any questions about this lemma? Is this clear? Maybe plus ones. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, does this number uh, in the green uh, corresponds to the uh, place where? Uh, this edges, uh, this edges uh, change uh, the uh, directions? Yes, yes, this is exactly the definition of it. So for instance, if I have here number three, yes, this means that I have uh, outgoing edges to the first three guys here and incoming edges from the, from the, from the remaining ones. Yes, so the, now the, if, you, if you look at T of W together with this vertex, this vertex will be sorted in between the, the third and the fourth vertex. Okay, thanks. So yeah. could you please uh, explain once more the rest of the proof? Yeah. So 
Um, so the idea is that um, is that now uh, we would like to say that uh, a subset of this vertex of of of, of H, yes, uh, together with W, yes, uh, forms a transitive tournament if and only if the the indices uh, on, on the subset form a non-decreasing sequence. And in one direction, if they form a non-decreasing sequence, then you just put those guys into those gaps and you observe that uh, the order in which they are put uh, is the same as the order that is, uh, that is, that is on, uh, that is in H, yes? And you will see a transitive order on, on, on the whole thing. And on the other hand, if you were, pu if you were putting simultaneously a two vertices such that uh, they're not in the non-decreasing order, then you would see a directed triangle here and uh, this would be a contradiction. Yeah, you would not be able, you are not able to put both of them at the same time. Good. Are there any more questions? Good. So now the remainder of this boils down to solving the problem of taking the longest non decreasing uh, subsequence problem. Yes, of, uh, we are now given a, a, a sequence of, of integers and we would like to find the longest non-decreasing subsequence. Sub and this is a standard dynamic programming uh, uh, um, algorithm uh, that runs in n square time uh, that you probably have seen on the introduction to programming. Essentially, I got a dynamic programming table which for index i tells me what is the longest non-decreasing sequence finishing and this index i. And then I can uh, update this in, in, in linear time for every, for every consecutive index. So this problem is p time solvable. And this concludes the proof. Good. So are there any questions at this point? Uh, uh, would you like to ask something? Uh, otherwise, put a plus one if you, if you are on the same page. Good. Good. So let me go to the next example. Mm, uh, the example that was actually an original example where the interactive compression uh, uh, was discovered. Uh, and this is the example of the odd cycle transversal problem. So now we are given again a graph and we would like to delete k vertices from my graph in order to get a bipartite graph. So for instance, here I would need to delete, uh, remove all the triangles again. So maybe I would like, to, uh, I need to remove this vertex and now to, um, uh, to kill also this triangle, maybe I need to delete this vertex, yes? And the remaining graph is actually a forest which is in particular by one. Yes, so, but now I need to uh, remove um, vertices to, in order to kill all the odd cycles, yes? Which is why the name odd cycle transverse. And our goal now is to give a free power K algorithm for odd cycle transversal. And this, as I said, was the original uh, place where this, uh, um, uh, where the technique was invented. And this is a paper of Reed, Smith and Vetta from 2004. Um, good. So, Again, the same idea. We are working with odd cycle transversal. So it boils down to odd cycle transversal compression where we're given a solution Z of size at most K plus one. And this boils down to solving this joint odd cycle transversal where we are given a solution W and we are seeking a solution that is disjoint with W. Yeah? And we would like to solve this one in running time two power L times a polynomial where L is this uh, number of vertices uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll should be the deletion budget. The deletion budget. Uh, in the disjoint uh, odd cycle transverse. So. Um, good. And the same reasoning as before shows you that if I am able to solve this one in, in, in time two power L, then I'm able to solve the or original problem in, in time three power L. So from now on, we can focus on this disjoint OCT uh, problem where the situation is as follows. I've got this set W um, here. Um, I do not need to know that it is small, yes? And I've got the rest of the graph, graph H, yes, which is the remainder. 
and I can assume that it is a bipart. It is a bipart graph. So I can fix some bipartition. Part A here and part B here. And what we are looking for, we are looking for a subset of vertices in here to delete, yes, of size at most L, yes, such that uh, the whole remaining graph uh, is bipartite, so it has some bipartition, say LR. And this bipartition LR may have nothing to do with this bipartition AB of the, of the graph uh, H. Yeah. So is the setting clear? Uh, is the problem clear? Is the reduction to the disjoint part clear? Are there any questions? It's once. not immediately clear why. Um, will we will we show that it doesn't matter that the bipartition, the, like the final bipartition, can be different from the one we fix? That's well, it can be very very different from one we fix. Yeah, we fix the bipartition A B of H because we know it is bipartite, so we will use this bipartition in the analysis. But the final bipartition of the graph after exclusion X, after exclusion, after deleting X, may be orthogonal to this bipartition AB. Yeah? Because this bipartition LR can include and will in include some of the vertices of W. Yeah? Because W we cannot remove and say, for instance, if a vertex of W uh, is adjacent simultaneously to somebody from A and to somebody from B, then it will need, one of those guys will need to change the side in a sense. Are there any more questions? Okay, maybe some plus ones if we are on the same page. Good. So now we do, as we usually do, we do branching. So you recall that we are we want to do to do this in in in, in time two power uh, two power w. Yes. Uh, well, okay. We need to we need to know that w is small. But uh, uh, when we start this algorithm, w is small. W is of size at most l. Yes. So in time. 2 power w by by branching into 2, two power w uh, uh, sub instances we are guessing a partition of this w into the left side and the right side yeah because we know that this vertex of w they will not be um, they will not be deleted by the solution so we know that some of them will go to the left side and some of them will go to the right side so we we guess how they will go, yes, to which side. So the situation now is as follows. I've got here the part that should go to the left and here the part that should go to the right, yes? And here I've got the remainder of the graph. And from those guys, I need to delete some, some vertices, some set of vertices X, yeah? So let's look at this instance. And let's, let's fix a vertex here, yes? And okay, maybe not. Uh, okay, let's look at one vertex. And this guy should go to the left, which means that all the vertices that this guy sees in here, both on the left and on the right, both on the uh, A part and the B part, these guys should go to the right. Oh, unless they are deleted, of course. Yeah, because if, if, if he sees them. So if I take FR to be the neighbors of, of this left part uh, inside this H, yes? so here is FR. So this is the neighborhood of this left side. Yeah? Then these guys are sort of forced to be taken into the, in, into the right side of the bipartition. Yeah? And similarly, if I look at the neighbors of uh, of this of this uh, w intersection r then this set fl these these are guys that should go to the left side of the bipartition unless they are deleted right because these these ones are um, guessed to be on the right side okay so i've got these four sets fl intersection a fl intersection r fr intersection a and FR 
intersection B. Uh, sorry, this uh, is at L intersection B. So now comes the main um, the main observation that if I have a solution X, what my solution X should do, it should cut all the edges or all the paths that go between the following pairs of those of those four sets between this set and this set. Yeah, so all the paths going like that, all the paths going from here to here from here to here, and all the paths going from here to here. So why so? Imagine that X did not cut some path from here to here. Yeah, so for instance, there is a path like that. This means that this vertex should go to L, yes? This vertex therefore, uh, therefore should go to R. So this vertex should go to L. So this vertex should go to R. Yes, by parity, now we have a contradiction because both of these two vertices were forced to go to L by uh, what happened on the set W. Yeah? So every such path, it will be of odd, of odd length because this graph H is bipartite. Yes? And this path needs to be cut in order to not get a contradiction. Yeah? It, one of those vertices on those paths needs to be in X. And similarly, if I have a path from here to here, If this guy is forced to go to, to, to L, this must go to R, to L, to R, to L, to R, to L, but this guy here was forced to go to R. So again, we get the contradiction, yeah, with the bipartition. So again, X must hit every such path. And the remaining paths are, uh, are, are analogous, yeah? So the paths from here to here and the paths from here to here. And contrapositively, I claim that if my solution X actually cuts all those paths, all the paths between those four pairs of, of sets, then actually X is a solution. So why so? So imagine that if it was not a solution, then there is a odd cycle in the graph. And this odd cycle, it needs to go through W. Yeah, and uh, well, because in, 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 the, in the graph H, after exclusion of W, there is, no, um, there is no odd cycle there. So for instance, if this, if for instance, I started with this vertex of W, yes, I go for instance here, yes. Then what I can do, if I cannot go to neither this set nor this set, yes, in order to again go to W, I could all either go somewhere and go to W again from this set, yes? But then I essentially do not change the parity because I do an even number of steps, oh, sorry. Uh, from here, I can go only back here, yes, to left. Because I do an even number of steps and I go back to L, yes? Or what, I, what could happen is that I do an odd number of steps, yes, and I go to R. Yeah, but then this is the other side. Yeah, so I either do an even number of, of, of steps and I go back to the same thing, or I do an odd number of, uh, of steps and I go to the other side. So because of parity, I cannot close an odd cycle in this way. So all the cycles in my graph are even. And this proves this observation. Good, so was this uh, observation clear? And uh, if so, uh, um, put a plus one. Good. There are some plus ones. Uh, I hope that, uh, that for the others, this is sort of semi clear. You need to stare a little bit at this argument to understand that, uh, that this is really a case. But the conclusion now is that we would like, now we are left with the problem of finding the smallest possible set X that is a minimum cut between which part? Between this and this on one side and this and this on the other side. Because cutting all the paths in those four, between in those four pairs, means exactly cutting all paths between this pair of sets 
and that pair of sets. And this is a minimum cut problem. So it can be solved in polynomial time because I can just run the max flow algorithm. So what we what happened here is that by iterative compression and guessing who goes to the left and to the right, we reduced the odd cycle transversal problem to the max flow problem, which is polynomial time solution. Good. So this is uh, the end of the algorithm uh, of with running time 2 power L times polynomial for this joint OCT, which implies 3 power K times the polynomial for OCT uh, in general by iterative compression. So, um, yeah, uh, are there any questions at this point? Otherwise, put a plus one. Okay, good. So in the remaining uh, 10 or so minutes, I would like to uh, very quickly give uh, another um, so this was essentially it for the iterative compression. As you see, the, 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 the whole technique is not very complicated. It essentially boils down to induction, introducing vertices one by one. Um, it is, however, quite powerful in the sense that it gives you a very good start when you are thinking about some problems. So just start with iterative compression and start to analyze the structure of the, of the graph. And uh, having a solution that is one too large simply gives you a, a helpful start. So at the end, I would like to uh, present to you a, uh, another basic technique that uh, should be always in your sleeve when you are uh, working with, uh, with, uh, with parameterized algorithms, namely dynamic programming on subsets. And the basic uh, problem for dynamic programming on subsets is the set cover problem, which is uh, a problem that you have probably seen somewhere. The problem is as follows. Uh, I've got a universe. Uh, these are those black dots here. Um, so these are some elements, and I've got some family of subsets of this universe. So these are this orange subset. So for instance, this is a subset in my family, this is a subset in my family, and so on and so on. And I would like to, uh, and I've got some budget K, budget for covering my universe, because now I would like to, to take as few sets from my family as possible in order to, uh, to cover the whole universe. So for instance, I could, um, I could uh, take this one, yes, maybe that one, yes, um, this one. Oh, and I need to take actually that one. And now uh, using four sets, I, I measure, I, I managed to, to cover the whole universe. Okay, so uh, there are three natural parameters for this problem. One is the budget, the deletion size, uh, the, 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 the number of K. One is the size of the family uh, that we are working with, and the other is the size of the universe we are working with. Yeah. And uh, the size of the, uh, so then you can ask about parameters complexity of each of these parameters uh, separately. So for the parameterization by the uh, size of the, by the budget, by K, this is actually what's called W too hard. We will understand what this means more precisely in January, I think. But we assume that this has no FPT algorithm. But of course, the problem is XP, yeah, because we, you can very easily have uh, the number, the size of the family to the power K algorithm by just looking at all K tuples of sets from uh, from your uh, from the input. Uh, for the parameterization of uh, by the number by the size of the family, there is a very simple algorithm working in time to power the size of the family. You just iterate iterate through all the uh, through all the subsets of the family, yeah, and check whether there are solutions of size at most k. So what we are now interested in is the last parameterization by the size of the universe, and I will show you a two power size of the universe. Algorithm FPT algorithm uh, for this problem. Okay, so is the problem clear? Are the goals clear? Are there any questions? Okay, 
I see even some 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 plus ones without asking uh, happening. So the main idea is to cover larger and larger subsets of the universe using dynamic programming. So more precisely, for a subset of a universe of, of the universe, say A, yes, let phi of A be the minimum number of, of sets that I need to cover it. Yeah, so the minimum size of a subfamily that covers the whole of A. So obviously, phi of the empty set is zero, and we are interested in covering the whole, uh, the whole uh, universe, which is phi of the whole universe. Yeah? And now the idea is that this, this, this function of phi satisfies a very basic recurrence, right? So if I would like to, uh, to cover a set A, what I can do, say this is a set A, what I can do, I can cover some subset of, I can take some set S from my family, yes, and I can cover the rest from the recurrence, yeah? So this is the minimum possible, so we, this means, uh, so this minimum corresponds to, to browsing through all the possible sets S from my family uh, that cover something, yes? And uh, I can assume that I can take this S uh, into, in, into, into, uh, into my cover, and then I am uh, left with covering A minus S, which I have already pre-computed in my, in my function phi. Yeah. So this, this shows that this function phi uh, satisfies this basic recurrence. And from this basic recurrence, we can, we can uh, essentially make a dynamic programming algorithm. So there are two power size of the universe values to compute because there are two power the size of the universe values of function phi um, that, uh, that we would like to compute. And whenever I am interested in one value phi of A, yes, it takes polynomial time to, to compute this formula because this boils down to browsing through all the um, sets from my and from my family. So then this gives me an algorithm that computes all these uh, values of phi of A in time uh, to power the size of the universe times polynomial. Okay, so this is basic uh, dynamic programming uh, on subsets. Uh, was this clear? Are there any questions at this point? Please put plus one. So this was very simple, but uh, somehow it is often omitted by people in the sense uh, that dynamic programming is not very uh, straightforward to see in some occasions. But it's always good to have it in your mind that, uh, um, that you can do also dynamic programming on subsets. So let me give you at the very end one more example of this, uh, of this principle, namely uh, the example of the Steiner tree problem, which is a very uh, important problem. Uh, it's a basic, basic network design problem. So what we are given, we are given a graph, a graph G, yes, and we have some subset of terminals. These are those uh, green vertices here. So imagine that this is, for instance, oh, they are actually, uh, sorry, orange. Um, imagine that, the, say, this is a network of some, of some country and these are important cities and we would like to connect those important cities. So by connecting those important cities, I mean I would like to uh, by as few edges as possible, or in the edge-weighted case, as cheap subset of edges as possible that connects all those terminals. So for instance, this would be one solution, which is also called a Steiner tree uh, connecting those terminals. So our goal now is to give a free power the number of terminals algorithm for this, uh, for this problem, and this is all often called the Dreyfus-Wagner algorithm. Uh, from the names of two guys who invented it in the 70s. Yeah. And the idea is essentially to do dynamic programming on subsets of terminals. Yeah? Uh, here T is a set of terminals. The idea is to do dynamic programming on subsets of terminals because the, when you look at the Steiner tree, yes, it sort of iteratively connects larger and larger subsets of terminals. So for instance, this Steiner tree here, yes, it, at the last step, it connected this subset of terminals with this subset of terminals, before it connected this subset of terminals with this subset of terminals, and so on and so on, in some sense. So yeah, we can now write this dynamic programming table. 
So for a subset of terminals A, yes, that we would like to connect, yes? And for some vertex U in which we are going to connect those terminals, we would like to understand what is the cheapest tree that connects all of all the terminals of A to the, uh, to the vertex U. Yeah, U is an arbitrary vertex of the graph. Yeah, so this boils down to finding the weight of the cheapest tree connecting A and U. So the solution would look like, um, what would look like that, that here I've got those terminals of A. Yes, here I've got my vertex U. Yes, and a solution could look like that. Yeah, this might be not single edges, this might be actually longer paths, right? So of course we are interested in, uh, in, in connecting all the terminals. So for instance, we can look at the uh, state, all the terminals and some terminal T chosen uh, arbitrarily. And the base case when I'm interested in connecting one terminal T um, to a vertex U, then this boils down to just completing the distance between T and U because it always makes sense to, to take a shortest path. Good, so now the main idea is that now we have uh, defined the state and the value of a state uh, of dynamic programming. So it's, it now boils down to writing the recurrence for, the, for, for my um, function phi. Yeah? And this is uh, actually pretty simple, right? Because if I would like to, if I have here a vertex U and here I've got my set of terminals A, then as, written, as drawn on this picture, the optimum Steiner tree will go to some vertex V and then gather in this vertex V a subtree connecting some A1 subset of terminals and a subtree connecting some other set of terminals A2. Yeah, and this will be a non-trivial partition of the terminals. And this is essentially uh, what is written here in this, in this recurrence. So in order to compute phi of A and U, I need to take the minimum of how I need to, uh, I need to make a minimum over all the vertices V where I will have this branching, yes? And all the non-trivial partitions of the terminals, yes? I need to gather A1 in V, I need to gather A2 in V, and I need to take the shortest path between U and V. So again, this is a recurrence. So we just for all the states in a bottom up, up way by increasing uh, sizes of, 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 sets, uh, of sets of terminals that we are interested in. Yes, we are computing these values of the function phi. Yeah, so I've got how many? Uh, well, two power t times n states. Yeah, because this is the choice of A and this is the choice of U. Yeah. And the computation for each state A U takes time. Well, now it's not polynomial time because I need to go through all these partitions, right? And the number of those partitions is two power A, yeah? The, all the subsets of the terminals because uh, it's a partition into a subset and it's complement. So the total running time is, is, is what? For a state A U, yes, we use this running time. Yes. So now when you look at it, it's, it's a, I can put all these polynomial factors in front and just have the sum of uh, two power A over all the subsets of terminals. Yes. And this is again, um, essentially binomial expansion. Uh, this, this sum is equal to three power the number of terminals. So note that in this case, even though we had only two power T terminal uh, states to compute, the running time is actually free power t because the computation for each state doesn't take polynomial time. It takes, uh, uh, free, uh, it takes uh, exponential time. So just to, um, just to conclude here, let me say that actually this can be improved. There is an algorithm working in two power t times polynomial time, but you also need to have here uh, additional factor w, which is the largest weight. So this works in the regime where the weights are integers, yes, and then the largest weight in unary is 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 added to the uh, to the complexity. As far as I remember, it was like this is a result of Nedelov.
I think from 2013. Yeah, maybe we will show this, uh, this, this algorithm at some point. Good, so this concludes uh, my lecture. I hope that, uh, uh, that you don't mind that I uh, prolonged it uh, a little bit. Are there any questions at this point or is something unclear at this point? Or put a plus one if, uh, if, if, if everything is clear. Good, I see some number of plus ones. So uh, thank you very much uh, for, for, for this lecture. And uh, in, I think, 25 minutes, there will be tutorials by, by Wojtek. Uh, so I guess we can stop recording now.